Hello, I'm Michael Redman, professional Nindong Go player. In this video, I'm going to show you the second game of the Mingneng title maps. So that's uh, sometimes called the Chinese Meijing. In Japan, we have a title called Meijing. In China, uh, the title called Mingneng. And in Korea, they have a similar name. I think it's Myeongjong. Um, my Korean's not so good, so I might have that wrong, but it's a similar name, similar pronunciation. The same Chinese characters. Um, so the same meaning. I suppose it would be translated to mean a uniquely gifted person or something like that. It's a, um, so it's a similar meaning in all three countries. So this is the Chinese title match between Mi Yuting and KJ. So Mi Yuting is defending his title. He won the first game against KJ and it's a best of three. So it's a three game title match. KJ actually had a great game in the first game. Um, unfortunately for KJ, he made a mistake towards the end. So I did make a video of that game also, and I'll, there will be a link. Okay, Black plays a tight Shimari. There was a period after Master, or AlphaGo, that is, uh, when we hesitated to play this tight Shimari because the Master version of AlphaGo would play a shoulder hit here, and Black would generally answer fairly tightly and end up playing too many moves to get an over-concentrated position. So once we realize that Black can actually just play away, maybe a, a pincer on the left side of the board, or just play away to play a Kakari in the, maybe the left lower left corner, um, then Black, obviously, without adding stones, Black will not get over-concentrated. And so it's actually okay to play the tight Shimari, provided you're ready to play away in some cases. So white, um, instead of playing a shoulder hit, white plays a Kakari here. And this Joseki. So then black plays here. And this is another version of the two popular Josekis um, played when black has played a knight's Kakari. So these are... Um, Josekis that I would recommend for beginners or weaker players to learn. Now, the thing is that when you have the complicated Josekis uh, with a lot of moves to memorize, you're in actual play, um, unless you're both very strong players, your opponent will probably play a different move um, before you finish the Joseki anyway. So it's very difficult to gain from memorizing those Josekis until you have a full understanding. So these Josekis that have only two or three moves, it's more easy to define the meaning of each move. So for instance, this move is strengthening the black zone. It's a kosumi, a very solid shape, well-connected, and making strength towards the right side of the board, and making black's group stronger than the white P7 stone will ever get um, in, in the near future, that is. And then white plays the, the extension to stop black from playing a pincer at the same point, which would build on the top side, and with Black's strong position on the right, it would be putting a lot of pressure on that white stone. So each, each move has a fairly clear reason, and by understanding the reasons, and of course, because of the fact that there's a small number of moves to memorize, it makes it easy for weaker players to, to learn from this Joseki. So anyone who is a Q player, probably. And in this Joseki, White's kick at D3 is um, a more active way to defend the corner. It does give Black a pillar of two stones that allows Black to safely extend three lines. So Black is taking some a position on the side here again. So White plays this move. Um, this is probably like the big sides were the bottom side and the right side. So White plays the bottom side first, and Black is extending all the way. Uh, I did mention that this group is a strong position. It's a well-connected shape, and at any point, black can play at Q17 to make eyes in the corner, or black can press from above to make thickness or a strong position towards the center. Uh, pressing at O16 will be a forcing move for black. So with that strong group in the upper right as a uh, to back black up, black played all the way to the Kakari. So like a more cautious move would be somewhere in the middle of the side, but it's probably okay for black to go all the way and invite white to a fight on the right side of the board. So white does that. Um, 
with the this move in the middle of the side, you usually say that white is going to leave room to extend on either side. White doesn't really want to get close to that strong position that black has in the upper right corner. So that's why white is a bit closer to the bottom side. Okay, so white plays here. A very small extension, the one space extension actually is indirectly protecting the 3 3 point at R3. So one thing that's important to note is that when you've played a star point, and especially when you've kicked at R5 here, there's always the weakness at the R3 point. The 3 3 point is always a problem, um, and it's very easy to get into trouble with that. And actually, you see it in strong players' games also. You see fights around the idea that there's an invasion at the R3 point. And so by playing the, the extension at um, R8, white is defending that. Basically, if black jumps in here, white has a forcing move here. So that's one way that white is defending it. Also, if black plays a Kosumi here, white is going to immediately play this exchange and complete the corner territory, after which white can jump out. So this is what white is aiming to do, and black extends down. So black is stopping white from doing that, and if we just compare this shape with, for instance, if black plays here and white answers this shape, um, this is much less, it's, it's not as secure for white. And so this exchange of the extension down here for white one, that would be a gain for black. And it would actually still be a little bad Aji in, in the corner later on, not immediately probably, but there, it, this is something that black could use later on and it would be more effective to play moves like black 2 in this position than it would be in this position where white has an extra curl that the extra stone at 2 it actually gives white some extra space so um a very strong move that black played and white um so white is sort of hesitant to answer like this to protect the corner a safer way to do it would be somewhere on the second line like this but uh, that sort of loses some potential territory. And so the choice, it's a kind of a painful choice. So White's trying to indirectly defend the corner while continuing the fight on the outside. So that's what White is trying to do here. And Black's going to make use of that 3-3 point. So yes, and yes, so he plays here. So the move that Black wants to play is he wants to play here. Uh, because he's looking at that cut at p3. But the problem with this is that white's going to cut here, for instance, something like this, and capturing the two stones is big, but black's going to lose the whole right side. So uh, that's why he had to defend the, the cutting point at 2 and 4 before doing that at 1. So if white answers here, black is going to cover at 1, and yes, yeah, something like this. So either this way, or if white plays a hane, in this variation, black just captures the corner. So that would be a success for black. So when black kicks here, uh, white sort of wants to defend the corner. So that's what white did with this move. Um, and now the corner is secure enough. So like there is some magic of this move, but it's probably not, it's usually not a big deal. White already has a living shape on the side, so that's um, that's okay for white. Um, although it is big that black got to surround the center. So again, uh, black is threatening the corner with this move and defending against the cut here. So when if white cuts here, because of the black stone at M4, black can capture that cutting stone. So that's how that works. Um, white answered here. So if white plays away, again, black can do this and capture the corner. So that's uh, that's not good for white. Um, let's see, yes. So this variation. Um, it, white could have played the Kosumi here. That might have been a better way to defend the corner, although black still has this move. Uh, white will answer here. So white has a living shape there. Black can connect up in the corner but white has created this move on the side. So there's not really a significant loss of territory for white, even though the corner is a bit weak. So the game move, it protected the corner, 
but it, it, it's not so strong towards the, the left part, uh, or the side, you might say. So black cuts here. This result was, it was fairly good for black. It was close enough to an even game, I'd say, at this point. So white plays the extension. This is the last big move. So the top side and the bottom side are pretty much, and the right side. Three sides are pretty much finished, and black extends. Oh yeah, black played that and extended on the left side. The final big side. And finally we get to the the shoulder hit, yes. In this board position, it's a very naturally played move. Um, it's not quite a ladder breaking move yet, but um, white can escape the ladder at some point anyway, because this comes as an Atari. So black plays here. This is a Tetsuji where black plays an attachment on both sides to close off the center. Okay, so black extends. This is defending the cut on the fourth line here um, and putting some pressure on the white zone here. So if white were to cut here, I'd say black can even fight with this one. So locally black can fight. If the local position gets more dangerous, then sometimes black can just sacrifice the one stone. And it's probably not so good for white in either case. So white continues in the corner. This is actually a position where the game, the center is getting pretty big. So when I researched this with Katago, it was um, suggesting moves towards the center too. So like a move somewhere around here would be an option. Um, of course, these moves in the center of the board, they tend to be rather difficult to understand. So it's natural that white would continue with the corner. And if black bumps against, white's going to cover here. So that was the idea. And then white would, again, white would have a difficult choice here. The center is pretty important. So like just escaping here would allow black to maybe to surround the center on a large scale. So white might even be thinking of moving towards the center at this point again. And it would be a fight where maybe in some cases white would be sacrificing those three stones on the left. Black crawled and white bumped against black and played the honey. This is the head of three stones. It's starting to create Damizumari for white and black plays here. So at some point white, yes. So maybe he should have played this one first. And this variation, um, the cut here, it's, it's maybe not so effective because white has already played that Atari the exchange of one for two is a slight gain for white. It makes it slightly better. This would be good enough for white, I'd say. And the game he simply covered here. And yes, now it's not going to be in time. So at this point, when he played here now, black just ignored it. So this was a good result for black. And yes, so I'd say it's at this point, I, this game is starting to look good for black. Uh, again, uh, just to remind you, Miyu Ting is black, and he won the first game. So if he continues to win this game, it's going to be the end of the series. Okay, so there's, uh, yes, this move. So this is a Tesuji. Uh, for instance, if white extends, black can cut here threatening to capture three and five in a ladder and capture the corner. So that's an example of how it's working. If white covers on the left, then black's going to get the whole corner there. So that's, that's the best end game sequence that black has in the local position. Right now, most of the sides are finished, except for some, there's some open space on the bottom side, but the, Top right corner, that's a really big move, what, whatever black does. So this would be slightly more profitable than, for instance, doing something like this, which would be a bit more for white and a bit less for black. So that, that it's just a bit more profit for black. So white covered here. This is the strongest local move. And it could have turned into a huge fight. So for instance, maybe white could have played here and black's gonna connect and something like this, the, the group on the right, the black group on the right, it's not alive yet. 
Uh, but white's going to be in trouble in the center and the top side, the top side. And black's going to be okay if black captures one of those two groups. The right side is not dead yet either, so maybe this is okay for black. It's a very dangerous, exciting fight. But they didn't do it that way. Instead, white played here and played the ko. So black has this ko threat. This is a tricky ko threat. So usually um, you would think that this is locally a bad exchange, but black has a way to reuse that exchange, which we're going to see in the game. So black captures the ko. White doesn't have any really good ko threats. So white just connected here. And usually black would either connect it 018 or capture this stone like this. So that's the local move, but instead black has this move, threatening to live in the corner, and this. So when black cuts here, if white were to play here, okay, so something like this. Up to this point, it's pretty much forced. And if black plays here, it's going to be a Seki or a Ko. So white would probably leave it fairly soon. And maybe it's going to be a Seki. But of course, black could play at T1 at some point, And it would be a Ko. But at this point, white's probably going to play away. Maybe something like this. Um, and like it's going to take black a few moves to capture that white group. At the And the danger is that if black plays at T1, uh, now the black group is going to be in danger too. So there's it's a dangerous thing to do. It's going to take a few moves and it's going to end up being something like 20 points of black's territory when black wins the co. So it's actually not worth it in most cases. It's not going to be worth it for a while. So the timing is going to be tricky, but maybe they're both going to leave it and allow it to be a seki because as it stands, if no one plays at T1 or if black doesn't play at T1, there's going to be a white eye and a black eye, and it's going to turn into a seki. So it's either a seki or a ko, and no one cares. It, it doesn't matter, <laughs> which is sort of probably hard to understand, but um, it, it's not important after that. So black did have that potential, I'll call it a seki, just um, for argument's sake. And white answered on the right. This gave black some potential profit, on the side, um, but black could not actually realize it. Um, the whole sequence was a slight kikashi for black. It was a profitable exchange, but black did have to return to the top side. And white got to add a stone here. So even though white got to add a stone here, the fact that black got to cut it L2 once, it did um, make black a bit stronger on the outside, assuming a white move at K2 anyway. I'm black connected now. Okay, so they're in an end game. This end game is actually very difficult because at this point, everything is pretty much alive. So that white group on the top side and the white group that's floating around the center, um, they're both, they don't have um, a definable two eyes. Like they look like they have about one eye each, but they have plenty of room to move around it. So they're, they're going to be safe enough. And black's going to try to get some territory in this area that black is starting to map out now. Um, but the center of the board in this game is very difficult to finish. So it's actually a very complicated endgame. Uh, not an easy endgame to play. But black does have a small lead. So black plays here. Um, this finishes the ladder. It just makes it's a good Aji move, although it was a net anyway. This is a big move. They're playing big moves. Black is keeping his advantage at this point. Yes. So all of this fighting had to do with the fact that white could not allow these two black stones to escape. And black was reducing white's potential in the center. White had to keep this group safe too. So white's pretty busy doing both things at the same time. Uh, but at this point, white is safe enough. So white has two eyes in this center area. So there's one eye here, and I'd say maybe this point. There's, there's going to be another eye there.
Yeah, so they're finishing the end game. Black has a uh, lead up to this point. Let's just um, sort of fast forward to the point where Black made the losing mistake because interestingly, like in the first game of this title match, KJ had a great game going and he lost it at the last stage of the game, actually. Yes, so, and now Mi Yuting is gonna do the same thing and it's gonna go on to the third game because they both lost winnable games in this series. So this is where if Black had just played a simple end game, he would have had a slight lead. So the top side is really big at this point, curling here once and capturing the one stone. Uh, white can squeeze like this, and white has this huge coast threat, and the, this coast threat is big enough that black has to answer it. And so it's going to be like this. And then the game is, it's going to be a, it's going to be an end game. So like, this is an end game where E2, uh, the move I showed you at F15, that's big too. There's some big moves like um, S8. Um, I'll, I think I'll stop here. I did sort of research the end game. Black's got a few points ahead, maybe two and a half, three and a half points ahead. In the game, he pushes through here, trying to cut white off. So he's trying to make the squeeze of those five stones. Thing is that this is forcing, threatening Black's. So like if Black plays here, white can push through and capture these four stones, which is bigger. White's already alive in the center. So Black covered. And it's this huge coal, which obviously is painful for white too. Yes. And, but the upper right corner, that's really huge loss that black is incurring there. So black is, has kind of a dilemma here. Does black connect it? Uh, usually black would connect it S15, but you can see the whole area here. That's going to be white territory. So that's pretty big on the top side and the corner is going to be, the lower left corner is going to be a coal. So instead, black connects here. And that's pretty painful, but black did save the top side, losing a huge amount of territory in the upper right corner. Like that's, it's only a few points now. White has more territory than black. Uh, so white gets to connect here um, and black plays here. The lower left corner is a very well-known shape. It's a it's one of the basic life and death shapes where white plays here, and it's going to be a call. So there's actually two ways to make the call, but um, this is the one that's worth remembering. It sort of depends on all of these liberties being filled. So like uh, the reason they're, well, all of the liberties have to be filled is that when this happens, sometimes white can play here. And the point is that when black plays at four and white cannot play an Atari here because of a shortage of liberties, then it's just not working for white. So um, if white had one extra liberty, like if, for instance, if this stone was not on the board and white had a liberty there, then white would be able to play B, B1. So that's where the Dames Mari is important. If it weren't for that, if white had that extra liberty, then black would be trying this one, which would be a co like this. So that's also a co. All right, so uh, black cannot connect yet because then white would play an Atari and have a living shape. So black played here. And if black wins the coin in the corner, it's gonna be a five stone dead shape. So ne next, if black connects it A2, that's gonna be a dead shape. All right, so black ran out of co threats and finally plays this Atari, which is threatening a call, and white lives in the corner. So this is a living shape, and this is a call, another call. So it's a really um, exciting end game where black could have sort of done very little or done basically not played any calls or anything, and he would have been slightly ahead. Here, black is trying to avoid, if black just connects here, white can play here and the black group is cut off. So he's trying to do something about that. So what this move does, so for instance, at the very least, it's setting up a cut here. 
So sort of asking what White's going to do about that. And White played away. White, White's finishing the corner corner. And so White won that call. Black got a little profit towards the side, but it wasn't a lot. So at this point, White is already winning the game. And we'll just go to the end now. It's, the rest is just an end game, so it's pretty straightforward, I guess. Um, but White is now a few points ahead. Okay, so they're finished. Um, I think it was two and a half points per per white. And so in the first game of this title match, KJ played an amazing game, uh, but he made a mistake towards the end. He made a couple of mistakes, actually, and lost by a small margin. Well, he resigned. Um, and in this second game, Muting had a, an advantage and was taking it to the end, but he started all these codes towards the end and didn't quite work out. So um, that was a re reversal, and KJ won the second game. So they're one and one now. I will make a video for the third game of this title match. Thank you for watching. I'll be back.